Good morning. Today's message is called The Secret of Success. It comes from that little album called Guiding Principles for Positive Parenting. I almost forgot. <laughs> the one with a deer on it, or two deer actually, if you take a look back there. So, do you like secrets? Do you enjoy secrets? We had a lot of fun yesterday, Hannah and I. Actually, we had for several weeks keeping that secret from Daddy about the special music she was going to do. And Daddy had absolutely no idea. You should have seen the look on his face when he was wondering who's going to accompany Alison. He's like, well, what's Hannah doing? <laughs> I said, well, wait and see. <laughs> it's a secret for Daddy. You know, I'm not sure if I like keeping a secret best or finding out about one. How about you? can't really be sure, but I want to share with you really briefly one of the most exciting secrets we were ever a part of. It was about four or five years ago, and before the dear Neblet family was part of the ministry, and dear Sean was going to be getting baptized, and he was going to be baptized in Moab, and there was going to be a father-son a few days down there, and so a bunch of fathers and sons were going to be there, and at the end of it, Sean was going to be baptized, and he knew that his mother and sisters were going to be coming along. He didn't know that a whole lot of other mothers and sisters were going to be coming along. And so this was the big surprise on Sean. Well, our family had only just gotten back from England, two weeks trip over there in England. And I knew I had a lot of church responsibilities that weekend, and so we didn't see how we could go. So that was the scoop. And the Waters family, the ladies, the men were already down there, but the ladies had lunch at our house, I seem to remember. And we waved them off to Moab. And then as we sat down for lunch, what do you think happened in the Rain household? Two little voices, I think they were about four and six at the time, began to say, Molly and Daddy, I wish we were going. It sounds like it's going to be so fun to be part of such a big secret. Well, I began to realize, you know, the next day actually was my birthday. And Paul said to me, he said, you know what? What if I took care of all your church responsibilities? I said, well, how are you going to do that? He says, don't worry about it. Are you prepared to give them to me? And I said, well, sure. He said, I'll just make a few phone calls. And sure enough, he made a few phone calls, and all my church responsibilities were taken care of. (laughs) Come to find out, he told people, it's her birthday tomorrow, and I wanted to surprise her. (laughs) Whatever it takes, you know. So by 7 o'clock that evening, the Rain family are on the road to Moab, and nobody knows about it. How exciting. (laughs) So as we're driving down, and we drove all night. That was going to be the only way we would make it. So we drove solid through the night. And we were passing, I think it was Idaho Falls. And we knew that's where the Waters family were going to stay that night. And it was about 3 o'clock in the morning as we passed Idaho Falls. We kind of tipped them a wave. They knew nothing about it, of course. And that was part of the fun for the Rain family. So now we get there before a lot of other people did, and we realize nobody knew we were there. They thought we were back in Montana. So what are we going to do to keep this a secret till the very last? Well, we discussed who was going to be there and what vehicles we knew about, and we practiced, children, what we would do if we saw a certain kind of pickup come around the corner, because they might recognize our vehicle and see us and blow the surprise. So we practice, and so whenever we see a vehicle, children, lie down. And they'd lie flat in the seats, including me. (laughs) We'd all lie down, except for Paul, this is, (laughs) he was driving. (laughs) And we would practice this over and over. And then I remember we were in Arches National Park, do you remember that? We were in Arches and we're like, I wonder if anybody's going to show up, (laughs) find us. And we were sure there was Uncle Tom over there. And so we hid in the bushes, not many bushes in Arches, but we hid in a few. And it wasn't him. But of course, eventually the surprise came out. And you know, if you want to know more of the story, you can ask Sean or you can ask us. It was it was a great surprise, wasn't it? It was just a lot of fun. You know, this secret today is the success that we can have in our families. What is it? What is this secret going to be? I think it's been kept quite well under wraps for you today. As we go through more and more camp meetings, of course, it kind of gets out a little bit more what you're going to talk about. Anyway, do you think maybe this secret is a discipline method that you can always bank on? It's always going to work and never fail. Wouldn't that be a great secret to discover as parents? Well, unfortunately, that isn't what I'm going to tell you about today, but the Lord has the secret for you in that one. That's not today's subject. Maybe the secret to success for your family is to live in Montana. What do you think? 
I know there are some people from New Mexico who don't agree. <laughs> no, friends, that isn't the secret either. Maybe the secret to your success is just to read a certain book. And actually, you know, it is. The Bible is your secret to success. But we're not specifically talking about a book here today. You know, somebody knows about this secret. He's our enemy. He is well aware of this secret, and he's done a fantastic job of keeping it undercover so as you won't find out about it. However, should you stumble across this secret unawares, he has done an even greater job of making it very uninteresting, very unappealing, to keep it so that if you stumble across it, you're not going to recognize it anyway. This secret has been portrayed as an unnecessary drudgery, is old-fashioned and outdated by many. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, it says this, Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, friends, the devil has a plan, and he wants to put darkness, light for darkness and darkness for light, so that we're just totally confused now as to which way is up and which way is down. That's his plan. If we're confused, he's on the right road. So, let me share with you a little insight into the Rain family. When we know we're about to cross the will of our children, when we are tuned in and sufficiently to the Lord to hear him, we will say, children, just want you to know we're about to cross your will. It's a little kind of a heads up, a little preparation for them. Well, children of God, I'm about to cross your will. Are you prepared now? So, the secret of your success is, are you ready? Are you on the edge of your seats yet? The secret of success is schedule. And you all went, praise the Lord, we're so excited. You didn't? <laughs> well, guess what? It's okay. The next thing we often say to our children when they have the same kind of responses as you had was, it doesn't matter, children, if you're not enthusiastic. That's okay. We've got enough enthusiasm for you too. I have enough enthusiasm about schedule for every one of you in this room. So don't worry if you don't have much of your own. You'll get plenty as we move on. You know, bear with me for the next few minutes while we discover why schedule, let's say the word a few times, it might, might not feel quite so bad, why schedule can be the secret of your success. We're going to look at five areas. We're going to be really practical this morning. I just love it when we get down to the real things we can do something with. We're going to look at why schedule. You're probably already asking, why, Carolyn, schedule? I'm going to answer your question in just a minute. Then we're going to look at some how-tos of how to do a schedule. We're going to look at what part we as mothers play in this whole subject. We're going to look at how to keep on track. Often that's where we kind of go wrong. It doesn't stay on track. And then we're going to look at some of the benefits that there are to be had for having a schedule. So, why schedule? I want to take you right back to the beginning of the world. We weren't there, but we can read about it to the point where we almost can feel like we were, right? 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. Children, I want to ask you a question. You know we like to speak to you as children. What would it have been like if God did not have that principle? Back at creation. And you know what it's like, children, when your mother, you know, the table is set and everything's out there. If you, if you didn't have parents to guide you, probably you'd eat dessert first, wouldn't you? That dessert looks so good, doesn't it? So you'd probably skip the vegetables up front, have the dessert, and then you could go back to the carrots and the broccoli and all the rest of it. Well, what if God had done that in creation? What was the dessert of creation? Adam and Eve making humanity. That was the ultimate act for God in creation. What if God couldn't wait and he decided on day one he was going to make Adam and Eve? So here they are, children. Here's Adam and Eve. What are they lacking right now? Air. Thank you. They've got no air to breathe. <laughs> They've got no sunlight. They've got no dirt to stand on, no ground, no grass. 
Would they have survived very long children? No matter of minutes, they wouldn't have survived, would they? God is a God of order. He has a plan for us that our homes also can be a, an orderly place, that it doesn't have to be the haphazard experience that we are so familiar with. And I've got good news for you this morning. If it is that way, if it's kind of verging on that way, and you're anxious to be finally free from it, I believe there's some answers here this morning for you. So listen up. Children, who was the wisest man who ever lived? Solomon. Solomon. Thank you. Wise children. (laughs) Solomon, in Ecclesiastes 3, in verse 1, he says... To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Solomon was a man of schedule. He must have been. He understood the importance of time and how it should be used. And you can read that whole chapter there talking about time in every aspect you could think of. Solomon has dealt with it. There should be a time and place for everything. There's a whole message back there in the album, Guiding Principles for the Happy Home, on time. God's timeless treasure. So we're not going to go into great detail about how we should use our time. We're specifically today going to look at the area of schedule. So what would it be like if at camp meeting there was no schedule? So actually you didn't know which week it was in May you were supposed to come. What would that be like? Well, you've got, you know, actually, we do know a family that showed up at a camp meeting and they got the week, the week wrong, friends. They showed up on Wednesday and we all left on Sunday. Can you imagine how sad that would have been? Father had taken time off work and the whole, trip, the whole family had come and there was nobody there. What a tragedy. We met them, I think it was almost the very next camp meeting. They came to wherever it was because of the disappointment. You know, you knew what week to come, didn't you? What if when you got here there was no schedule, so you had no idea when a meeting was going to be or who would be doing it and what they'd be talking about? How would that be? You probably wouldn't be too impressed. You probably might think, I don't know if I'm going to go to one of those restoration camp meetings again. I mean, it's just kind of a mess. I'd agree. It wouldn't be good. How about the airlines? What would it be like if they had no schedule? Now, you know, I I can enter it. It does feel like it sometimes, like they have no schedule. In fact, the very last flight that we took was out of Spokane, as it happens. We couldn't get out of Kalispell cheap enough, so we drove to Spokane to get to New Jersey. Yes, it is a bit crazy to go one way to get the other, but we were prepared to do that, to cut the costs. And we, you know, we left our hotel room at 5 to 30 in the morning to get to the airport, to get on the plane. And I don't know what time we finally left Spokane. One o'clock in the afternoon. Got into New Jersey at one o'clock in the morning. So sometimes it doesn't feel like there is one, but generally, what if they had no schedule? So you'd get to the airport, not knowing when a plane was gonna leave, and not knowing where it might be going to. I guess that could be kind of fun if you ended up somewhere like Hawaii. But you know, generally, if you're planning to go to a camp meeting, you've got to plan for where you're headed. We need schedule in the airlines, don't we? They need a bit more. (laughs) We should encourage them. How about in our employment? What if there was no schedule? You know, what if we went to the doctor's office and we sat there for four or five hours because there was no schedule? You know, your employers appreciate you being on schedule, don't they? And yet, so often at home, the center of everything is the very place where we feel like we can just kind of relax and relapse. <laughs> now we don't actually need any kind of a schedule, just kind of whatever happens and whenever it happens, because you know, we can just want to relax at home. Is that the way it should be? Will we get the most out of home and family life if that's what we do? So I want to encourage you to get the absolute most out of home and family life. So listen up today. You know, we like to be really as vulnerable as we know how. We have been married for five years at this point. That's 15 years ago. (laughs) We were married for five years at this point. We were living in that itty-bitty travel trailer. You can see the pictures there back in the back table in the book. We've been living in that travel trailer for about three years at this point. And we were very busily involved in coal porter work, Bible studies, and running a branch Sabbath school as a result of all these studies. And at this point, I remember we had 13 Bible studies a week between us. And these weren't the kind where you just delivered the study and came back after they'd filled it in. We sat there and we went through the study with the people, two or three hours per person. 
So home was more like a motel, more like a B and B. There was no real home life going on. We'd be back at you know eleven o'clock at night or whatever, up early in the morning preparing studies and trying to squeak in personal devotions. And I don't think we even knew about family worship at that point. It was just the two of us. And there was something that was really handy for me. Right under my itty bitty sink in this tiny travel trailer, I had like a wire basket and I could put a plastic dish bowl in there, washing up bowl, and we could get at least three days worth of dirty dishes under the sink. (laughs) Don't go, ooh, Carolyn. (laughs) Yeah, we're just being open and honest. That's where we were 15 years ago. Didn't have any idea that that really wasn't an okay thing. Now, don't misunderstand me. My mom had taught me that you don't do that. But somehow you kind of, you know, think that this is going to be okay because my circumstances are different. And so we would do that on a regular basis. There was three to four days worth of dishes stuffed under the sink. Well, I hadn't read this then. In Daughters of God, page 176, it says, the dishes are not to be left to any other part of the work. Attend to the kitchen work first. Ooh, (laughs) didn't know about that one. Well, praise the Lord. You know what, if you find yourself, if you're saying, Carolyn, you're talking about my kitchen, it's okay. The Lord has a plan to move us on. Don't stay there, because it kind of, they get, those dishes get crusty, you know, it's not fun. It's it's, It's actually harder to do them that way than it is just to do them. We just didn't, you know, we were deceived in our minds into thinking it was okay. So if that's where you are, don't be discouraged. We've been there. We've done it. (laughs) And praise the Lord, the children, when they first heard us share this, were horrified. Mommy, you left four days of dirty dishes. (laughs) No, we don't do that at home anymore. (laughs) You know, at the whole point of a schedule is to help us to be in control of life rather than life being in control of us. Do you get the difference? There's a huge difference. We need to be in control of life by God's grace. And look at the second aspect now of how. That's the biggest question. When somebody is new to the concept, the next question that comes is, how are we going to do this? How do we start? You know, the first and most important key for you for having a family schedule that works is prayer. Number one, the most important thing. Because God has a plan. He knows how your family should operate. And your family and mine are not going to be the same. The schedule that you need, the schedule that I need, are going to be very different for our life circumstances. But the Lord knows. John 14 and verse 13 says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So if we ask our Father, He will give us the ability to come up with this schedule that's going to work. Do you think that a schedule in your family, even if you're a family of one, I want to encourage you, when the Lord brought the burden to Paul and I, we were a family of two. And for many years before our children came on the scene, we were living a schedule as a family of two. If you're a family of one or two, that's fine. The Lord has a plan for that. Do you think it's in God's plan for us to have a schedule to glorify Him? Absolutely, it is. In the book Patriots and Prophets, on page 509, it says, The secret of success is the union of divine power with human effort. Those who achieve the greatest results are those who rely most implicitly upon the almighty arm. So if you're feeling like Carolyn, you just don't understand. If you just understood me, you would know that I'm exempt from this deal. Well, what we're told is those who achieve the greatest results are those who rely implicitly. So if you're feeling like you're totally incapable, praise the Lord. You're probably going to have more success than the person who feels like they got it all together. So don't be discouraged if that's where you are right now. And if you already have a schedule that's working well in your family, please... Don't put your mind in park and just kind of tune out because maybe God's got something extra he wants to add for you in this, in this subject of schedule. So listen up. You know, it's quite typical. I get a lot of counseling calls that come through and usually if somebody calls during the daytime, my husband will pick up and he will help the person to make an appointment with me for the evening time when my children are tucked in bed and then I can devote 100% of my attention to you. 
Okay, so that's typically how I do it, but I don't do it night after night after night, otherwise my ch children start getting deprived of mother. And so what I do it as often as I'm able to. And so typically what will happen, you know, come 7.30, the phone will ring, and I, I'm now in a call with a mother, and quite often I will hear in the background one, two, three, four little fretful voices in the background, and a very heavily laden voice in the mother. And so we begin to talk, and you know, we're trying to talk over the noise in the background, and maybe she has to stop and go do something and try and attend to that and come back and we talk some more. And nine times out of ten, where we go that first evening is schedule. Because I can tell that most of what I'm going to say is not even going to register because the poor mother is frazzled with dealing with little itty bitties. Mine are already in bed, you understand. And often it's people whose time zone is an hour or two on from mine. And there's these itty bitties and mother and children are frazzled. So we usually get into talking about a schedule. And one of the most important things we talk about is when little itty bitties need to be in bed. And so, you know, as the months go on and we have several of these calls, I can't tell you what a joy it is to me as I get the phone call and it's silence, but just mother's peaceful, calm voice. And I'll say, so, where are the children? Oh, they've been in bed for an hour and a half. Praise the Lord. I can't tell you what a difference it makes. It warms my heart. And that's why I'm so enthusiastic, not just for me, but for you. Because I see the difference it makes over and over again. And then we can get down to some of the other nitty-gritty things that she really wants to talk about but couldn't because of all the frazzle. And 50% of the problems are already dealt with right there because of that schedule. So the practical how-tos. The first thing to do is to sit down with a blank piece of paper. Everybody can find a blank piece of paper. You don't have to do it right now. When you get home, sit down with a blank piece of paper and your family together. If you're a family of one, that's you and the Lord. If you're a family of two, that's you and your spouse or whoever the other person is. If you're a family of however many more, sit down together as a family. And you know, I know your one-year-old probably isn't going to have a whole lot of input. But when they're beginning to come up, they can have input too into how this schedule is going to work. So the most important thing you're going to have to do, first of all, is to put on that blank piece of paper things that are set in concrete. So the time maybe that father in the home has to go to work. Or maybe if your children are in public school, maybe it's the time that your children have to leave for school. Those things that are immovable, put those on the page first. And then you can begin to work your life around those things. So by knowing what time father has to leave the home for work, you know what time breakfast needs to be done by. Therefore, you know what time worship needs to start by, what time personal devotions need to start, what time you need to get up, and guess where that takes you. A will crossing number, what time you need to go to bed. <laughs> now, I'm not about to prescribe for you what time you need to go to bed. The Lord is very well able to do that. He knows your circumstance, he knows what you're going to start putting on your piece of paper, but believe me, today will not be successful without when you went to bed yesterday. So the first thing to figure out is when I need to get my head on the pillow for the amount of hours that I need to have so that I can be up in time for the next thing you're going to put on that schedule, and that is your time with the Lord. That is the most critical thing for this day. Tomorrow you need bedtime for today, but for today you need your time with the Lord. And I don't just mean mom and dad. I mean our children all the way down. All the way down, our children need time with Jesus in their different ways. And we have a whole message there called Feeding the Soul back on the table there. You can ask the folks behind and they'll point you to it. If you want ideas for what to do with your one-year-old and your two-year-old, for their time with the Lord. This isn't about that, but we can take you there. So having figured out those things, you've got bedtime, you've got rising time. You know, we're told in education on page 205, education 205, the importance of regularity in the time for sleeping should not be overlooked. How many of us overlook the importance of regularity in the hours of sleeping? <laughs> Don't raise your hands, it's okay. I know you all would have to because we've all been there. And you know, we have find, found out, maybe this was something revolutionary, it seemed like it was to us. We found out the devil has a deception plan. Come nine o'clock at night, you're thinking, yeah, you know, if I could just stay up till whenever, think of all the things I could get accomplished. The children are asleep, hopefully. And I could get all these different things done. And somehow, an extra hour or two, 
yesterday doesn't seem very impactive, but guess what? You put that into today, an hour or two off of today, suddenly you're two hours late for work or for school or just not being able to get up in the morning. We figured out that when you start feeling pretty comfortable about just stretching it out at nighttime, woe betide you for tomorrow. <laughs> We've learned by trial and error, the only way to go is to say, I am determined that I'm going to get my head on the pillow tonight when I need to get it there. So, tonight decides tomorrow. You know, we need to, in this schedule, we need to cut out the non-essentials. Now, your non-essentials and mine are not going to be the same thing, so I can't necessarily give you a whole scope on what those are, but the Lord will put that on your heart. He's knocking on your heart's door. What things are there? Maybe it's that monster that we sometimes find in the living room called the TV. You know, something, well, I'd encourage you, that thing can, <laughs> this is not about TV, but that thing can make its exit pretty fast. That eats away our time. That destroys schedules from, from ground zero and up. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's the internet. That's a pretty sneaky way because we can kind of go places that are really good places to go. But we find ourselves swallowing up oodles of time so our schedule goes up in a puff of smoke. So we need to keep out the non-essentials. Now, children, there's something we haven't put in yet that I'm sure is pretty important to you. What would that be? Playtime. Play Before playtime? Eating. Yeah, you can't play with no energy, so you need to eat first. E meal times are an important one to put in. And in, chi and, sorry, in Councils on Diets and Foods, page 180, it says, Regularity in eating is of vital importance. There should be a specified time for each meal. At this time, let everyone, everyone eat what the system requires and then take nothing more until the next meal. whole lot of principles just in that one little passage. But the one we want to tune into today is the regularity of eating. Our bodies actually get used to regularity. Our Lord designed us that way. So when we're used to eating at a certain time, our bodies are prepared for that. And if it's kind of here and it's kind of there and it's kind of anywhere, our bodies don't know what to be prepared for. And neither do the bodies of our children. Our children need that even more than we do, that regularity. Then when we put in these basics and we now have family worship in there and devotions and night, you know, sleep time and meal time, you know, it may take you, and you may be surprised at this, if this is your first attempt, it may take you a few weeks to get that underway. <laughs> Some people laugh and say, a few weeks, you mean months. <laughs> It may take you a little bit just to get that so that you're going to bed on the right time, you're getting up on the right time, you're eating at the right times, you're worshipping together, and don't put anything else into it at that point other than the essentials. When you feel like you've got that down and you're beginning to see progress, regularity now with that, you can start adding in playtime, family time, things you're going to go do. Maybe it's go visit somebody. Maybe it's an activity at church you want to be a part of, but you don't want to start cramming those things in while the other basic necessities of your family are not yet in place. What we tend to do is we say yes to this and yes to that, and we're going to go here, there, and everywhere, and the other basic foundations of home are not in place. And we wonder why it is we're just kind of frazzled, you know? It's because we didn't have the basics there first. And I want to encourage you, you know, back in the days, back 15 years ago, when we first discovered this newfangled thing called schedule, we didn't have a computer, at least if we did, maybe we did, I didn't know how to use it anyway, so I just had my piece of paper and my pencil and my rule and I would just make out my beautiful schedule on paper, and I went to the copy shop and I came home one day with 40 copies. And my husband looked at me and said, sweetheart, why 40 copies? I said, well, there's a lot of blanks in here for things extras that we can put in. And I want them to be different each week, you know, the things we're doing. And he said, but sweetheart, you'll change it a dozen times before you've used your 40 copies. You know, I didn't believe him. <laughs> By the end of the second day, I scrapped the first one and was wanting to redo. So please, if you find yourself having to do this thing over and tweak it here and jiggle it there, don't be discouraged. Your number one schedule that you come up with will not be the one you end with. You're going to have to tweak it around. And you know, as your children grow up and their needs become different, you have to keep tweaking this schedule. And so you're going to find that very often you've got a new plan, a new format, because life has moved on. 
Okay, we're going to spend some time now looking at the mother's part. This is part three, the mother's part. Do you think, as mothers, we might have a special part to play in this subject in our homes? What do you think? Yes. Absolutely. You know, where are the ones, if you think about it, those at-home moms? I've forgotten what title it was Elaine used in her little story that was excellent. I just absolutely love that. <laughs> That's us. We're the ones at home in this research and development center with all the things that go on. And, you know, for a while, I would feel frustrated that the schedule wasn't happening. You know, we make out this great plan as a family, and now this is going to work, and, and it didn't seem to work. You know, when it started to work, maybe the first hour or two, maybe the first day or two, but then it just kind of crumbled. Now, I know a lot of you moms have been there. You've had crumbling schedules. <laughs> well, I didn't understand that it was my privilege to be the overseer on a moment-by-moment, -moment, blow by blow, daily event of this schedule. I didn't know that. And at first, when I, when I began to realize, well, it seems like it's always me. If I'm not chasing this person and that person and running here and there, it doesn't happen. And I began to realize, that's not my drudgery, my sisters. That's my privilege. It is my privilege to oversee this schedule. No, it isn't my privilege to nag every family member to make sure they do it. But it is my privilege to oversee it, to be around, to just do a little reminder here and a little reminder there. And maybe we get a little sidetracked and I kind of say, hey, this, do you remember what we're trying to achieve? Oh, yeah. And everybody goes off and carries on achieving it. But I didn't know it was my privilege. When you get the vision, this is not your drudgery, this is your privilege, it gives it a whole new picture for you. So if you haven't got that vision, I know you can, because I received it from the Lord. It was a gift from Him. But you might say, Carolyn, you don't understand me. I'm not a naturally scheduled person. Well, yes, you heard. <laughs> neither were we, neither was I. But the Lord can fix that. Adventist Home, page 22, it says... A wife and mother cannot make home agreeable and happy unless she possesses a love for order, preserves her dignity, and has good government. Therefore, all who fail on these points should begin at once to educate themselves in this direction and cultivate the very things wherein is their greatest lack. So, if you find yourself sitting there feeling like, oh boy, you're not alone. If you find, if you're saying, this is where I lack the most, it says we can begin at once, not wait until maybe, you know, more than two years' time. Life's going to be, because we're going to be in the country then, you know. In two years' time, when we move to the country, everything's just going to be fine and dandy. Guess what? The Lord wants you to live in the country, in the city right now. No matter where you are, begin living the principles right now. And even though at the time Paul and I were looking for that little country cow shed in Ireland that you can see the pictures of, we didn't know what the Lord had in store, but that was what it was. It was another couple of years before he led us there. He was wanting to work with us right where we were. We began to put schedule into our lives, have family worship together, though it was just the two of us, and begin to really do some of these things right where we were. So I want to encourage you, begin at once, it says. On your way home, even before you get there, be planning out in your mind, and then you can talk to as a family. How are we going to do things that we can make the most use of our time and have a schedule that can honor and glorify God? Mark 10 and verse 27 says, And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So don't tell me, Carolyn, it's impossible. But been there, done it, can't happen. Are you going to defy the word of God? God says, with men and women, <laughs> it is impossible. But with him, everything is possible. You can have a schedule that's going to work for your family after you leave this place. I began to realize that the secret to the success of our secret, <laughs> our schedule in the family was the choices that I would make in my own day. And those choices, as we talked about, began with nighttime, bedtime the night before, and then began with what choice was I going to make in the morning? 
And the Lord has challenged me to be consistent no matter where I am. So no matter that I'm in New Jersey, where it was two hours ahead of Montana, and when I got up in the morning and put on my computer, I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> it is the middle of the night. <laughs> but I'm going to get up on schedule no matter where I am, because I find if I don't, and I'm here, and I'm there, and I'm everywhere, it falls apart. And by the time we get home, believe you me, we're on the road so much, there would be no such thing for me as schedule. I had to start with me first me personally for what I was going to do. You know, there is nothing like, and I know what that feels like with that pillow. There's something <laughs> magnetic, hypnotic, whatever it is about that pillow and getting our heads off of it. But if you start, you know, it takes us three weeks to make a habit, three weeks to break a habit. I want to challenge you to the next three weeks of making a habit to choose no matter how it feels on the inside, to make the habit anyway, to get up when it is you figured out you need to get up to have the time with the Lord you need to have and move on into your day. And after several weeks, I want to encourage you, you will start to enjoy it. <laughs> right off, you're not going to necessarily feel that good, but you're going to start to enjoy it so much that right now, it doesn't matter what time I went to bed last night, I can't wait to get up in the morning, have my time with the Lord, get my exercise, and feel like I'm in control of the day rather than the day in control of me. And you understand that that control is with the grace of Jesus Christ. But I, I can't, I mean, as you can tell, I am very enthusiastic about it. I can't tell you enough of the blessings that I as a wife and mother receive from just that one commitment with God. I am going to get up. And then I feel like I've got my handle on things and now the children get up and, you know, maybe this, there was this little wheel crossing situation or that one and it's okay because I've got a handle on things already. Often we get up because they get us up. And they're already falling apart at the seams. And guess how we are when we get up? <laughs> We're falling apart at the seams too. It's just not a nice way to start the day, is it? Now, I'm challenged because I have a little girl who has been getting up a bit earlier and a bit earlier. So where does that put me? A bit earlier. Because <laughs> I still need my time when there's nobody else around, just me and the Lord. It's, it's the most fantastic part of my day. And so I'm challenged. Maybe you're in that situation too. Don't be disappointed if your children are early risers. Be praising God for that. Because those of you that are not naturally early risers, you know the battle you have to have to get yourself out of bed. If your children are naturally, please praise God for that. That is a gift from him. We're told in Adventist home... On page 16, one very short sentence which my little girl had written out on sticky note and she'd stuck it on the back of her desk because she'd read it somewhere. Well, Adventist Home, I guess. <laughs> she'd read it and it had meant something to her. Adventist Home, page 16, says, Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Do you believe a schedule has anything to do with that? Friends, it really does have an awful lot to do with that. Because what we choose to do day after day after day after day is determining our destiny. And if we're going to have two hours extra pillow time and not have that time with the Lord... It will be determining, little by little, our destiny. Friends, I know we've said it and we'll say it again. Time is running out. Time is seriously running out. And are we going to get serious about our destiny? We all know where we want to be. And we all sit and talk about, you know, we're all going to be there. Friends, we've got to make some determined, determined, urgent considerations in our homes and families, in our individual lives that we will be there. And I believe every one of us can be, but it's not going to be without some determined effort and some significant changes. So, how do children respond to a schedule? Now, if you ask them when they're in their teens, they're going to be not too enthusiastic, maybe. But actually, all children thrive on a schedule. Particularly, the itty-bitty little ones thrive on a schedule. When there's a schedule in the home for the little infants, they don't have to fuss and whinge and cry, and then you think, oh, look, maybe they need a nap time. And they're not fussing and fussing, and then, oh, maybe it's meal time. No, the nap time comes right when it's needed before they ever get there. 
to being fussy, the meal time they know they can bank on it. You know, when our children live in a home where there is no schedule, you know, we know we're going to feed them, right? But do they know that? Or do they know when it's going to happen? And, you know, it's, it's stressful for a child. There isn't a security that they should have when they don't know what to expect and when to expect it. So our children thrive. We're told, Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 163, regularity should be the rule in all the habits of children. That's pretty conclusive, isn't it? In all the habits of children, regularity should be the rule. If you want to get the best out of your children, that's the key, regularity. Schedule brings a peace and harmony to the home that you're not going to find in any other way without it. Home becomes a place of order where you love to be rather than a bed and breakfast like we experienced. Now, a lot of people have asked me for our schedule. And in fact, we have oodles of copies printed out for you on either of those back tables, which you can feel free to take. There's Hannah and Caleb's schedule. There's my schedule. And there's the school schedule that our children have. Actually, if you go onto the website, and I can't remember the web address... (laughs) My husband tried to drill me in, but I can't remember it. If you go on our website to the free downloads page, you can download, I know some of you have already done that, the schedule, and there's something new on there I want to tell you about. Even the office doesn't know about it. Paul's put his schedule on there too. (laughs) So if you want to see what his schedule is, print that one off because I didn't have that one here. But please feel free. There's only one thing I don't want you to do with this schedule. Don't copy it. By which, I don't mean don't photocopy. You can photocopy as many hundred times as you like. Don't pattern your schedule off of the Rain family schedule. Because I can guarantee you, no question asked, it's going to fail. You're not the Rain family. You're your family. You're unique. The Lord knows just exactly what your family needs for the age and stage that you are. And this is just an idea. This is just a guideline for how to get a schedule together. A few tips and thoughts you might not have thought of, but then go to the Lord. He has a plan for you. If you're an individual, if you're a couple, or if you're a family with children in it. Let's look at the fourth area, keeping on track. So now you're with me, you're into the idea of this schedule. Maybe you had one, wasn't working too good, and now you're going to go home and tweak around with it. But you're saying, Carolyn, how do we keep it going? It's a very good question. And the only reason it's there is because we've had to learn by trial and error how to keep it going. You know, we've said that on a day-by-day basis, we're the key, we're the mainstay of this schedule, moms, and we're the ones at home we're the ones that are on a day-by-day basis going to keep the thing going. In Adventist Home, page 179, it says, Every member of the family should realize that a responsibility rests upon him individually to do his part in adding to the comfort, order, and regularity of the family. So how many people of the family? Every member of the family has their part. Of course, the infant in mother's arms is not going to be as responsible as some of the older ones in the family. We all have a part to play is what that means. And fathers, I know oftentimes it's like, well, that's her thing. Believe you me, it's not her thing. If you're not a part of that thing, that's a big piece missing if you're in the home, but you're not a part of it. So... What we find that we do on a regular basis in helping to keep that schedule on track is we sit and have what we call family board meetings. Maybe you call them family council, whatever you want to call it. In our family, because the children are used to daddy goes off to board meetings, we have a board meeting and we sit down and we say, so, what's going on with the schedule? And I'll say, well, you know what? Seems like I have to keep waking the children up and they aren't getting out of bed. And we've been there. I'm just sharing with you reality. We've been there. And one particular day I said, children, I feel like I'm just going around after you, getting you out of bed. And you're going to drink your water and you're not very enthusiastic. And it's kind of hard on mommy. I leave my quiet time to come down and what can we do different? They came up with a plan. Let Jesus wake us up, mommy. And I'm thinking, yeah. (laughs) I wonder how that's going to go. Praise the Lord. I did not say, huh? (laughs) Praise the Lord. I said, sure. And for a whole week before the next camp meeting, my precious children were getting up earlier than I was waking them up. Because Jesus knows when they need to get up and it now has motivated them. Hannah has been setting her clock back 15 minutes and 15 minutes more, getting up. She's only now, roundabout, getting up about an hour later than I do. I'm not telling you when I get up. 
You can go find out on the schedule back there. <laughs> if you want to talk to me about it, that's fine. We can do that on one-to-one. -one. So having our children, being a part of this whole thing as a family is very important. You know, for us, people have asked, well, how do you keep a schedule when you're in and out and up and down and you're everywhere? You know, we were home last week, the week before we were in New Jersey, a couple of weeks we'll be in Minnesota. Life is in and out that way. How do you keep it together? Well, when Washington camp meeting was the only camp meeting we came to, we could afford a week of downtime to recover, okay? Maybe that's what you're going to do. <laughs> we could do that, but we can't do that anymore. You have a week to recover, and before you know it, you're on the next airplane to the next place, and we never recover. Just in a, a, a life of unrecoverableness, <laughs> if that's a word. So we had to talk as a family. What are we going to do? How is this going to, how are we going to achieve this in our home? And we now give ourselves the privilege of one day to recover. That means we're going to get home on Sunday night somewhere from town meeting here. And Monday we might not get up at quite the usual time, although I'm committed to, for me. <laughs> the rest of my family may not be quite on their usual time. But by Monday night we'll be in bed at right on usual, if not a bit early. So that come Tuesday morning we're right up on time and the schedule is rolling out as if nothing had ever happened. Now you may not have to challenge yourself to do that. Although, friends, I would encourage you, if you do do that, you are redeeming a whole lot of time right there, rather than having a week's worth of that recovery time. Now, did you notice that little quote said, every member of the family? Now, I may step on a few toes, and I hope I don't, but that every includes our young people, our youth. That every is you precious young people too. You know, have you, I've observed over the years that it seems like around the time that our young people leave for college, or maybe they go off to some kind of employment, and whereas mom and dad who have been encouraging and carrying out a schedule at home, our young people leave and, and they leave the schedule behind. Now I can only tell you I know because I've been there. I didn't grow up with the, with the knowledge that you have young people. My parents were Adventists, they were Christians, but they didn't know these principles. So when I left home, I just did whatever I was going to do. I and mean, I was a nurse, and so my hours were all over the place, and I ate at all kinds of times, and slept at all kinds of times, and stretched it out at both ends of the spectrum, burning the candle at both ends. Young people, I want to encourage you, you're in the prime of your youth. Don't destroy all the, what the parents have poured into you as you've, as you've been growing up. Child Guidance, page 363, says, Students, that's youth, young people, should not form the habit of burning the midnight oil and taking the hours of the day for sleep. If they have been accustomed to doing this, they should correct the habit, going to bed at a seasonable hour. They will then rise in the morning refreshed for the duties of the day. So young people, it's a challenge because now things aren't quite like they used to be. You know, your, your younger siblings are still doing their usual little things with the usual little schedule, but the Lord can give you wisdom to know how to still live by principle when you're outside of the home, when life isn't the same as it used to be. The Lord will give you the wisdom for that. You know, it doesn't have to wait until you're married and you have children before the schedule thing comes back into your radar. It can be right there all the way along with you. So, to summarize, we've looked at why schedule, how practically to get it off the ground, who's the main one to keep it on the road, keeping it on track, and now we're going to look lastly, just the last few minutes, at the benefits of schedule. Schedule will be the secret of your success. Do you know why? Because as it becomes a part of you, I don't look at this schedule, okay? I don't go there and think, so, now what are we supposed to do next? I don't go there. It's a part of us. It's just who we are. And as it becomes a part of you, it'll be what happens in your family. Other people will see the difference. There's no question about it. Now, some people are going to see the difference in a negative. Huh, well, they don't do this anymore, and they don't come here anymore. And, you know, no, when there's things happening in, in our local church that we love to be a part of, I'm absent in the evenings. Why? Because it's 45 minutes away. And by the time we get home, it's usually a couple of hours after bedtime for my children. Do that consistently. What happens to your schedule? 
goes out the window, doesn't it? I know, lol, you were, you were giving one of your seminars there in our local church a few years ago, and I was absent, wasn't I, <laughs> for most of it. Did I really want to be there? Did my children really want to be there and see all this wonderful stuff? Absolutely. You can ask them. You can see. <laughs> they really did. And we tried it out the first week, and our schedule was a disaster. And I knew what the Lord was calling for me to do. Does it cross our will? Absolutely. But are we doing it for eternal investment? It makes such a difference when we recognize why. Adventist Home, on page 32, says, One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of, a, of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. If you catch this vision, this will say more about Christianity than every single message you hear here at camp meeting this weekend. If you catch the vision, and no, you won't wear this label on your forehead that says, we're on a schedule. You won't have to do that. It'll be a part of you. People will see that there is something different, something stable, solid, and reliable about your family. And that is why it's a secret. It's happening underneath. It's happening behind the scenes. Nobody kind of sees you running around to find out what's the next thing on your schedule. It's a part of your life. So what will it cost us, this schedule? Not dollars. It would be handy if it did, wouldn't it? I mean, if it cost dollars, wouldn't some of you say, oh, here they are. (laughs) Phew, got that one dealt with. No, it's not going to cost dollars, but it's going to cost us. Number one is time. It's going to take us time, first of all, to figure it out, and secondly, to carry it out. We're going to steal from the pillow time that we want to have and just the whenever, whatever time that we're going to have. You know, the last camp meeting we were at, there was a precious soul, and I'm guessing she was probably around early 70s, and she came to the table after I'd shared this message, and she said, ooh, you stood on my toes. I said, I'm so sorry. And she said, no, it was great. She gave me a big hug, and she said, you know, I thought I owed it to myself when I was retired to do whatever I wanted to do whenever I wanted to do it. And she said, you just told me clearly that that was not the case. Praise the Lord. So I'm not picking on you. (laughs) See, we've gone through all the ages here. I'm not picking on you if you're now retired thinking, oh, this is my chance. Just, you know, finally get to the point where I can just relax and do whatever. The Lord may not have that plan for you. The Lord may have a very different plan. It's going to cost us, as we've said, our pillow time. But by comparison, what are we going to gain? First off, the most obvious one you're going to gain is a more peaceful contented home, peaceful and contented children. Children thrive on regularity. You're going to gain quality time with God. If it hasn't been a part of your schedule because you just couldn't figure out how to get it there, when you have that schedule in place, you're going to, that's something you're going to gain. That will be huge in preparation for eternity. You're going to gain quality time together. Why? Because you scheduled it in. It's part of life now to have that quality time together. You're going to gain an improvement of, body, of your body, mind, and spirit because you're getting decent sleep now. You're getting the fresh air you needed as part of your schedule. And so you're just going to be improved always around. And last but by no means least, a definite step in the right direction to preparation for eternity. So my encouragement to you, and I hope you've caught some of my enthusiasm. I don't have any less than I started with, so it's a bit like the five loaves and the two fishes. It's just multiplying. (laughs) I hope you're going to go away with some of my enthusiasm. I want to encourage you. Let's go home and make this secret a success in our homes and families. I'd like to encourage my family to come up, and we'd like to sing for you, Let All Things Be Done Decently and in Order. Let all things be done decently, decently and in order. Let all things be done decently, decently and in order. Let all things be done decently, decently and in order. Let all things be done decently, decently and in order. Let all things be done decently, decently and in order. Let all things be done decently, decently and in order. Let all things be done decently, decently and in order. Let all things be done decently. 
Dear Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your, your grace and your love. And I just ask that you send your Holy Spirit to each of our hearts, that you apply into us a desire. Um, give us a new desire if we have a schedule to implement it more firmly or, or uh, check it out a little further. And if we don't, to really um, not just have a desire to start it, but a desire to continue it and implement it. And more than that, Lord, I just ask that you fill us with each of these messages that we can carry them out in our lives in practical application and in love because you are coming so soon. And the world needs as much as each of us need you in us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.